So when we're looking at the buried cable system, let's get into a little bit of technical parts here. We want to, we want to trench. We're going to trench about nine inches. Doesn't matter if you have a frost, frost line or um, uh, clay soil or sand or anything like that. We're going to go on an average of nine inches and it doesn't have to be perfect. One of the things that uh, was a big problem with the early buried cable systems was your trenches had to be perfectly spaced apart and they had to have a perfect uniform depth to start with. The micropoint system or the microtrack system isn't like that. About nine inches deep and about one to two meters apart. Okay. If we're going to put, um, uh, uh, if the sole's rocky or if we're going to put power and data lines in the same trench as the processor, we're going to go about 12 inches deep on that. Uh, we're going to backfill with some sand and then we're going to apply the cables on top of that. Uh, believe it or not, rocks do migrate within the ground. Rocks move around in there. They, they're constantly moving. Uh, vibration in the ground moves them. Um, they can cut the cable. It can move the cable. Um, one of the things that we do is, I don't know if you guys notice that or not, but there's like a little green, it's a little greenish tint to it. That's a fluid called Vistinex. It's a self-healing cable. So if rocks do migrate in the ground and they move over and they cut the cable, or if rodents try to come in and chew on the cable, that Vistinex leaks out, it seals it, and it puts off anything that may damage the system. So we lay the sensor cable on top of all that, and then we backfill. Of course, we want to put some caution tape in there so that if anybody is digging, hopefully they hit the caution tape first. Rarely does that happen. Usually it's a couple electricians with a big trencher and they just go right through the middle of it. And going back going, hey, what's this cable in the ground? Would this scenario work on either side of the fence? Sure. You could put one set of cables on one side and one set of cables on another side and have the fence not in the detection field. You can't put a transmit cable on one side of the fence and a receive cable on the other side of the fence and create a detection field that way. It doesn't work. That big, unless you're using a fiberglass fence, a fiberglass or plastic fence, something like that, you can most certainly do it. But if you use a metal fence, every time a piece of metal touches another metal and you introduce an RF frequency to it, um, that's a make or break connection, which in RF terms means that's a short or an open. In R terms, it means nuisance alarms. So imagine a chain link fence, every diamond has a potential for four nuisance alarms. Yeah, it gets, it gets pretty bad. And then of course, uh, Come on. We put a little mound. We'd like to see a little mound over the top of that. One or two inches or something. Mound a little bit of extra on top. Even if you tamp it down, uh, the ground always settles. No matter what, always settles. And the last thing you want to do on a nice, clean, covert security system is show them exactly where the trenches are in the ground. Right? This is a good indication of the sensor field. Imagine these are your two sensor cables in the ground. They're about... Uh, what are we at? Uh, about five feet apart. Yeah, about five feet apart right there. So this is showing us different field profiles at different decibel levels. We have the ability to adjust the sensitiv sensitivity on this. We can adjust uh, the field, the primary field uh, strength on this to make it a much larger field or a much smaller field. And when we do make those adjustments, this is typically what it looks like. You notice here that uh, the bottoms of it kind of tail out a little bit. This is very important for those people that have two fences. If you're going in between two fences, you need to definitely pay attention to this. Reasoning behind that, our clear zone spacing. We use a three to one ratio for standard. If your cable spacing is at three feet, then we need three, six, nine feet to the nearest fence. If your cable spacing is at four feet or three feet and we're using a roadway, then, uh, or uh, train tracks, and we expect large vehicles to drive by them, then it's a four to one ratio. Three, six, nine, 12 feet. Make sense? Three to one ratio for fences, four to one ratio for roads. There are a couple other factors that come into that. If your soil is super sandy and doesn't attenuate, you may want to give yourself a little bit of extra space. Uh, but when we're working with you on a micro track system, we are involved from the very beginning to help design your system. because. Nobody is more of an expert than us at knowing these little nuances. And we don't charge for any of that. It's part of the plan, what, yep. what we would, we want you to be successful. We want the end user to be happy. And so the more involved we all are from the beginning in setting these things up with these little nuances, uh, keeps everybody on, uh, with a smile on their face. And while we can have our local representatives, you know, Tom and his group come out to look at a site, 
uh, a lot of times it makes sense for Jeff or myself to also come out into the territory. We can come out to the territory and do a site evaluation, site walkthrough with you and your customers and, uh, and give you a pretty good idea of how well a system or how poorly a system would work in, within a certain area. Uh, and again, we do all that stuff at no charge. We do the site surveys at, at, no, at no charge. And uh, we've got guys back at the factory. If you've got Google Earth images or photos of a site, um, you can send all that stuff to us in-house. And our guys at the factory can review all that stuff and give you a thumbs up or thumbs down as to whether you should proceed or not. So uh, please consider us uh, in as a, a helpful decision maker. We're not trying to sell you a bunch of equipment. We want to make sure your systems are designed efficiently and, like Jeff said, with no nuisance issues. That's, that's our big deal. Our, our biggest thing is sensor operation. We focus very hard on making sure the right sensor goes in the right application. So what happens if I've got a nine foot clear space here, but I've got a two foot diameter razor coil on the bottom of my fence over here? Do I still have a nine foot clear zone to the fence? No. Good. What happens if, uh, one more. What happens if my fence has a two foot part of the fabric that curves under the ground? Does that affect it? Right? Yeah, so those are things we need to take into account when we're doing a site survey. What about giant thorn bushes? <laughs> giant thorn bushes on a buried cable system won't have an effect unless they're right on top of the cables. This can go through different types of vegetation. We can split trees. I would never know why someone wanted to put a transmit cable on one side of a tree and a receive cable on the other side, but you could do it. Someone could lean a ladder into the tree and jump over, but you could do it. Uh, we do a, a lot of VIP residences with the buried cable system. And usually it's right at the edge of a forested or a, uh, like a garden type boundary. They'll have a wall, they'll have some trees, some flowers, and a buried cable system inside that. So you can't see the security system, but um, uh, you certainly interact with it. Uh, small vegetation, no problem. Vegetation with big leaves on it that uh, hold a lot of water and hold a lot of raindrops, problem. So water is our mortal enemy for everything pretty much. So the less water, the better. If you have like, say you have a, an area where the water just seems to run uh, over <coughs> the table, you know? So a solution for that, um, if possible, would be a crushed aggregate, like a, like a crushed rock or gravel or something like that. Water moving with a dispersed surface area is much better to go over the sensor cables than water moving in a combined or in a concentrated area. So if you have a ditch, and your water has to drain from a parking lot down through key areas into the ditch. And the buried cables are somewhere in between that area. What I would say is, if at all possible, run a pipe that goes under to channel the water around. If you can't do that, then crushed rock. If you can put crushed rock on the hillside, you eliminate 90% of your issue. If it was always in that scenario, it's just a matter of tuning as well. Like if there's always one area. If, if it's always running water, like you have a creek that goes across it? We don't want to put the cables there if it's always running. If you have a pipe that's in the ground um, and there's always water in the pipe, no big deal. But if you have a pipe in the ground that's empty, it's like, like a 20 inch pipe that's empty and water flows through and then stops, that was going to look like a big target going through. So we want to shield that. We would use a metal shielding, metal foil shielding to protect that pipe. Yeah. Electrical wires, high voltage lines, anything like that, uh, we can go under the sensor cables. 10 to 12 inches under the sensor cable takes it completely out of, out of the sensor field in the ground. And perpendicular rather than parallel is... Exactly. So anytime we have wires in the ground, we're going to run perpendicular, 90 degrees. The last thing you want to do is run cables at an angle like this. So you have a, a phone line, or not even a phone line, but a ethernet cable that goes in the ground at like a 40 degree angle. What's going to happen is that RF field is going to expand. It's going to latch onto that and it's going to grow in that area. And then anytime someone connects or disconnects from that, that length of conductor is going to change and it's going to look like nuisance issues. But it may not just be right there. You may get a nuisance alarm down over there because that cable might be 100 feet long and it's recognizing 100 foot of distance in there, which may correlate to 100 feet that way. It gets ugly. So. Make sure any cables in the ground, anything that's uh, near or around the cables are perpendicular to it. Good? All right, so here's some, uh, some unique buried cable applications. Remember I said about that airport? Yeah, it was this guy. 
uh, what we did is uh, they've got a couple runways and a bunch of civilian companies all around these runways that also have access to it. TSA wanted to cover the airport itself. They put two chain link fences in with Micropoint on the fences and your anti-barrier cable system right across. So now the terminal and the area where the airplanes board passengers is completely encompassed with physical system. When the airplane passes over that buried cable system, cameras look at it, the video analytics decide whether it's a person or a plane. Pretty easy for video analytics to do that, right? That you can rely on. It doesn't matter if it's raining, sunshine, or night. A plane and a person, two big different things. Um, but if you have someone that's gonna drive a car out there or someone that's running across the runway, it's very easily identifiable. Uh, so that was a good application for that. And then uh, this one is my favorite. This is a, a, a museum in Egypt. They took our guidelines to heart and they designed the outer perimeter around it. They created a botanical garden around their security system. This rocky pathway is where the buried cables are. So they designed this rocky pathway all the way around the perimeter of the facility. And at night, when people aren't supposed to be in there, they turn on the buried cable system and that pathway becomes their security zone. There's never standing water. It's tapered. Water always flows off of it. It's clean, it's clear, it's beautiful. It's, this is just one of the best buried cable applications I ever could have come up with.